So uh, today um, we've got Matthew Shears, um, co-chair of Working Group OC Working Group One, Freedom Online Coalition, um, moderating discussion on regulatory frameworks, and Tatiana Trapina of the Max Planck Institute, um, uh, moderating discussion on capacity building. Um, this will be done in, in two halves. Um, first, we'll be looking at regulatory frameworks, and then we'll be moving on to building, and then we'll be looking at um, sort of interrelated concepts that are across the subject. Thank you everyone who's um, been joining in the series so far um, in the series how to engage in cyber policy for human rights defenders. Uh, I hope that it's been useful um, and you know the, the, the point provided you with foundational knowledge um, needed to enable to engage in um, cyber policy debates and start shaping the discussion to be human rights respecting by design. We and you know the debates will differ from country to country, but hopefully these videos and these Q&A sessions will provide you a solid starting point to sort of kickstart these debates in your own um, localities. Um, the training series is open to all, and will feed into the in-person training component of the overall cybercast building training program. Um, and uh, this will help you um, make these processes. Uh, the world more inclusive by building your capacity and advocacy skills and for stronger collaboration in developing rights respecting for policies. A uh, particular session is a, is a chance to gain clarity on concepts, issues and frameworks introduced um, in both the regulatory frameworks and uh, cyber cast wielding modules. Um, and really we decided to merge these two because there are so many over over um, which um, are better discussed together. Um, the processes in place is particularly important when dealing with cybersecurity policy debates, um, which up now have been relatively closed to civil society. We hope this session will help answer your questions um, to help you sort of break into those spaces. And throughout this series, we've understood that security concerns are a huge problem for the international agenda. Um, the frequent sort of cross nature, um, cross border nature of these risks means that they require cooperation between states. Um, these measures between states are an important way to address these concerns, but who sets the standard here? The work needed from human rights defenders to ensure these collaborations are right, rights respecting and to see as a crucial enabler of security. This is for non-state actors, including um, human rights defenders like yourself. This is a capacity building effort in itself and helps to provide you with a starting point to clarify any questions you might have uh, on these on these subjects. So without further ado, I'll pass it on to Matthew to kick off the regulatory framework section. For that excellent introduction. Um, it's um it's a pleasure to be here and wonderful to be working with uh, with my co chair Tatiana Tropina. Um, the the topic for today, for the first first part of this, is as Aditi said, it's on regulatory frameworks and um, the excellent videos that you have um, seen on some two videos you've seen have been focused on stakeholders, uh, how to engage and where to engage on stakeholder approach on the now as a particular example of a multi-stakeholder approach. We've looked at um, levels of engagement and where. Um, at the regional and international levels, um, why is cybersecurity a key policy issue for human rights advocates, um, and um, some of the spaces that uh, we need to engage in. So now it's an opportunity for you to discuss questions. Um, we'll be having a, a, an interactive discussion um, amongst us on the, uh, between myself and Tatiana and the other um, discussers. And hope we'll be able to answer all your questions and um, and really bring uh, framing and um, uh, to this discussion. So, with that brief introduction, um, let me jump in and just say that we've we've had a number of questions. And um, before we start, we've had a number of questions, but um, we certainly welcome additional questions. And please do feel free to uh, write them in. Um, what often is um, how oneself in the policy process and what are the kind of the first steps that occur in that policy process and um, the question that was was put to us was really 
what's important are consultations in policy processes and in regulatory approaches, and how does one get involved in those consultations? And if there aren't consultations, then how does one really encourage those consultations to be held? Um, and before I, I turn to Tatiana to, to jump in on that one, I would say that one of the key things that we found is that there are consultations and consultations. In other words, they can differ substantially. Uh, I think we'll come to this more in the discussion, but there are consultations when um, the views of holders may be asked for, and then those consultations are closed. Uh, the process becomes closed after those consultations. The consultations are asked for as the government or the consulting party actually does account for what was said and incorporate what was said. And so it would also consider the fact that, that a typical can take many different forms and can result in different levels of engagement for society. And therefore, it's not just one type of consultation, but we have to look at what's the actual impact and the value of that consultation in terms of taking the policy process forward. So Tatiana, maybe I, you can jump in on this one as well. Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. It is very nice to see you all uh, on this session. And I hope we, uh, we are going to make it uh, interesting and interactive for you. So about consultations and consultations. Matthew is absolutely right. Well, first of all, let, let's divide consultations on policy consultations and on all consultants because policy making processes and law making processes are two distinct processes so in the policy making consultations uh, basically in those open venues one can engage on engaged on any stage like in the beginning in the problem identification in the problem solving in the solution in the implementation in, in, in the assessment of this policy. But if we are talking about lawmaking, it is more, let's say, restrictive, because normally in, in a country, in a democratic country with a separation of powers, um, lawmaking is, 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 a, is a part of the uh, legislative process, which is basically owned by a special legisl uh, legisl legislature body. And uh, public consultations here are usually launched on the page when the view is discussed. And um, while policy processes are sometimes, how to say, more open and, and more self-explanatory uh, with the legislation, legislative consultations, it's not always that obvious. So one has to monitor the calls. And as Matthew already pointed out, there are consultations and consultations. I saw that there were questions about the examples and maybe I will just go ahead and make two examples of legislative consultations just to illustrate how, how it can go. Um, the first one would be rather a positive example from South Africa, where last year uh, a, a parliament introduced a cybercrime and cybersecurity bill, which was um, open up for consultations and performance from different organizations for, I think, almost uh, three months end of August till November, or uh, more than three, uh, I'm sorry, bad, bad mathematics sometimes, I just lack math skills. Um, and um, surprisingly, all the consultation, all, all, all the comments, especially comments submitted by civil society, some legislators back to the drawing desks. So I have to amend the bill on the basis of the civil society comments, or let's say on more broader stakeholder comments do include civil society. The second example would be the uh, UK Investigatory Powers Bill. Maybe um, if you're interested, Matt uh, can cover a bit more on this because it's it's its country. But as far as I know, that the, it, was, it was really a fast track. The bill introduced quite intrusive investigatory powers and uh, the common period was like around three weeks and the fast track set all the discussions very quick and many comments were not addressed. So it's just an example of what Matt called, um, you know, the second type of the consultations, what government actually has to do in the open and democratic society. They, they have to launch a call for written submissions, for uh, written evidence to this proposal, but uh, there is no willingness to listen to this. 
and the last an overall comment about all this. If stakeholder policy making in in the in the global in in the more broad realm of governance and cyber policies, there are many open venues. <clears throat> when it comes to the cyber security and to legislative processes, these venues are more closed. When it comes to the leg legislation on national level, it's always the let's say it is still a good will of the government. It is in, in democratic countries, whether they're going to listen to public comments, whether they are going to take them into account. And even in even if the government launches these consultations, it is still hard sometimes to get through and, and, and get your voice listened to. So, yeah, it was quite a long intervention, so maybe we can move on. Maybe Matthew can add something on this follow-up. Thanks. Thanks. This is a, um, a really interesting subject area, actually, because the, there is, um, as I alluded to earlier on, and Tatiana has mentioned, there is a, a there is a sense of a notional consultation, a consultation that takes place either um, on two or a consultation that takes place after information has been provided to the government is trying to consult with. So the good case for really assessing the um, way in which the consultation is put forward in the first place and what and whether or not it's actually having the desired effect that uh, another stakeholder in a multi-stakeholder system would like to see. I think the key issue really is how does one anticipate when a regulatory process or the initiation of a regular, regulatory process necessitates a consultation? And in that process, can a consultation start? And I think there is a uh, reason that consultations should have the kind of import that they have on regulatory processes, but that's not always the case. Um, if consultation has not been initiated, or if it's been initiated with too short a time frame, I think that's a legitimate reason for uh, discussing with the government and possibly looking to other stakeholders to the issue with the government. If the consultation process or the timeline did. Um, as I mentioned, in some cases, those processes can be forced or brief for um, processes of law in particular countries. But it is important from the outset that governments who are consulting know that the consultation has to be meaningful and legitimate um, when they start down such a route. Um, so to, uh, I'm sure we'll come back to this issue, um, uh, to, to another issue which has come up in the, the, um, in the question. And maybe something, this is something that you can come to. It's a question about what is the law and what is the policy when addressing cyber issues? And, and what do those two things mean for advocates? And how do advocates um, cases? Maybe you can take that one. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, definitely I can take these two. Um, policies are different. So there is a lot of overlap in in, in terms of what we do a civil society in our let's um in our efforts, in our advocacy. So policy is more conceptual thing. Policy is I'm just trying to find a good example um, um, in, 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 a, uh, in, a, in in simple terms. Um, policy is framing the issue. Policy is suggesting how to solve the problem. Policy is how to say uh, opens the doors. Policy is paving the path to the legislation. Before I start drafting of any law, I have to know which problem I'm solving, which direction I'm going to, I have to set my goals, I have to set my aims. For example, in cybersecurity, in, in terms of cybersecurity, before I pass any law or regulation, I'm going to make my networks secure and resilient. I better to think about the strategy. What is my aim actually? I want to achieve 
resilience in five years. I want to bring industry and other stakeholders together. I want to do it in an open or closed manner. Also can be one of the policy issues. Um, I want to do this and that steps. And then I develop a strategy how I achieve this. But to bound different stakeholders, because we do need to regulate. If I'm setting the policy that aims to protect the data of my citizens, I establish the frameworks for compliance of uh, those who are operated with personal data. So you see is when I'm saying I'm going to make my the city of my country to government or agreed as the range of stakeholders. We want the personal data of any citizen or, or of anyone who is going to the internet to be um, secure. And I want to know if there are any breaches in personal data. I don't want data to be traded like, 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 like a commodity between operators. I want to have safeguards on the police. So the policy. Um, I have to implement certain regulations. If I need data protection, I'm going to come up with a legal framework which make operators responsible, which operators of data to ask uh, for the consent of users. And that will make regulatory frameworks on, on how I'm going to do this. All the consent is made, how this consent is, is, is got from the user. So these are basically two things. Policies are conceptual, and if if not following the policy, nothing will happen. Of course, it would be sad if I say I want to um, make my network secure or, or I, I'm saying I want to fight cybercrime. Doing this, this is a very unfortunate situation, but there's no um, no possibility to, to, to actually force me to do this. Okay. A subject for enforcement. If I say that no one can hack into someone's network, I establish criminal. Uh, this. So anyone who will commit a crime would be a subject of criminal liability or fine imprisonment. If they, the personal data uh, data processing companies or anyone who has to deal with the personal data on the commercial basis has to treat this data um, only with the consent of users or only for the purpose which they were collected for, I frameworks which require compliance from, from these operators. The, the line to draw between policies and, 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 and legislation is enforcement. Laws can be enforced by the government. There is such thing as self-regulation. Internet service providers uh, in the country say, well, we clean our networks from the botnet and then pass the code between them, the circulation code. These frameworks are not enforced in a way, we can imagine how government is enforcing the laws, special agencies, or with police, or with enforcement bodies. The regulations, as self regulations, are enforced on the goodwill, on the basis of the goodwill of, of, of the industry, let's say, of all the entities who voluntarily agreed to follow these rules. So, yes, let's, the line is control. Because of the possibility to enforce. Thanks. Thanks, Tati. The One of the questions that often comes up, and one of the challenges I think is fair to say that human rights defenders face, is knowing which uh, processes and where one engages in, and ones are more open to uh, human rights and which ones are more closed. Um, typically, Cybersecurity policy spaces have been driven by governments. Um, opening to other stakeholders, it tends to be traditionally most likely business because many of the telecoms companies and others are responsible for critical infrastructure. And if not business, then the technical community where they can bring a particular perspective on, um, on, the, on the cyber attack or the threat or, or um, society it tends to be a bit more difficult and for human rights defenders as well. And one of the things that we found is that it's often um, most difficult to bring to cybersecurity policy processes on human rights alone um, and effective to 
um, build um, co-test, if you will, with other stakeholders to bring one's views on human rights and a range of other issues of interest to civil society into the cybersecurity debates. So the great merit in looking at which stakeholders advocates can partner with and get at, get around the table. Um, one of the, the tricky things, and this is not just particular to civil society, but it's true of all stakeholders, is incredibly important to to, to bring something to the table. Um, it's not only about bringing the importance of human rights to the table, but it's also about bringing the, the other issues um, that human rights have an impact on. So it might be social issues or economic issues. There are, there are different ways, depending on the issue and depending on the, the, the closed nature of that particular policy issue in the way human rights defenders can can get a seat at the table. But how about that, Tatiana, let me just say that it's, it's not just about getting a seat at the table. It's actually incredibly important that um, the, the views brought to the table um, um, are built on and adding value to the discussion. And it's it's very it's very easy to say, well it's multi stakeholder anybody should have a seat at the table and oftentimes it's not multi stakeholder one isn't invited but even when one is sitting at the table one needs to bring to that table and to that discussion very constructive um, substantive arguments and discussions and that's when it makes a lot of sense to um, the perspectives of other poly other groups and other stakeholders and what interests are around the table as well. Tatiana, you can, a little bit because I know you you engage in a number of these kinds of processes from a human advocate point of view. Um, yes, when listening to you, I was thinking that um, sometimes we are talking about the ideal world. We sound like we are talking about the ideal world, but I really want to make the example from my personal perspective. I got involved into all these cybersecurity and cybercrime issues, like I don't know years ago or so. Seven years ago, I, I moved to Europe and I started doing cybercrime research and, and cybersecurity. And I really, really wanted to get involved into real fora. And I found out that except uh, those requests institute, those those requests for policy processes, the governments which my institute participates in, I didn't have that much of engagement, I didn't find that much of inclusiveness if I was trying to knock on, on, on cyber security doors. How did I solve this problem easily? Uh, I found out that once I am um, uh, approaching the issue from a broader perspective, let's say from the internet governance perspective, the European dialogue on the internet governance juridic perspective, uh, from the um, European um, uh, um, network address systems like RIPE and CCC um, for, from, from IXP's internet exchange points point of view. Sometimes when I'm getting involved into the broader network on the broader not only cybersecurity, but for example, different frameworks, policy development, many do for me because I understand the broader concerns. Once you meet people, security experts, including governmental uh, uh, who are in fact dealing with cybersecurity as well. Uh, you got included dialogues and, and, and many forums. Once you can bring the constructive things, you can participate in the dialogue constructively and you can bring expertise and believe me you are learning a lot during during all these processes as well. Uh, not only in, uh, from substantive uh, knowledge point of view, but also from the view of communication, from the point of view of reaching compromise, of uh, listening to other other stakeholders and actually understanding their interests and their concerns. It helps a lot. Um, frequently confronting, confronting law enforcement agencies with their demands on uh, governments with their demands on um, investigatory frameworks. But as a lawyer and as a person who really communicated with law enforcement agencies, I know their concerns. So I'm not only confronting in terms of saying, no, 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 this is totally against human rights. I don't want to listen to you. No, 
I understand what they mean. And instead of just simply confronting, I'm always trying to do a solution. I'm always saying, no, be inclusive. No, I have to implement these and that safeguards. No, this provision per se, this construction will not work. But we still have to think and we can find other instruments which will be design or by default. So think from a broad perspective. If you are knocking on the doors and they are not opening, maybe you are uh, not the right doors. Maybe there are other ways which will bring you to the right fora. So think from a broader perspective. I think we mentioned this already, but it never hurts to repeat this again. There are many possibilities for you. From where you are. There are many people to get to, to get engaged with, and not only governmental people. There are different rights defenders, there are business people who will be ready to help you once you bring uh, your knowledge into this discussion, once you bring um, uh, active things. Thanks. I'd just like to add to that before we go to a, a slightly different question, um, which I'm going to put back to you, Tatiana. But let me just add to that. There are, there are a couple of other things that one needs to bear in mind that um, make the case for civil society and cybersecurity spaces and, and, and talk about cybersecurity in the broadest sense. Um, there are certainly one work the way this worked is to emphasize the importance of, of Internet is pervasive across society and economy. And there are um, stakeholders and there is expertise that is not reflected in consumer policy when those stakeholders and that diversity of stakeholder and that diversity of expertise is not brought to the table. It's very easy to um, policy make isolation, it's easy to do so um, with this idea of emotional consultations. So it's really important that we think about how we can be at the table and then how we can remain at the table. Because in many cases, it's, it's, um, it's in one issue and then drop away. But what, what policymakers are looking for is a kind of consistency engagement, um, that probability of engagement, and the fact that they're looking for, um, typically looking for people that they can work with. So there's that element of, um, of annuity, if you will, when it comes to um, development of policy and um, policy making as a whole. So that's a key issue. And then the other issue is, as Tatiana and I mentioned earlier on, is the finding, finding ways to get to the table uh, just by partnering with other stakeholders or looking at an issue from a broader, broader perspective. No, the impact of cybersecurity and cyber threats and cyber attacks. Um, there are many social dimensions and implications of cyber attacks. And it's important that those perspectives and those concerns are reflected. And I think that's another dimension that can be taken um, to making a convincing case for uh, human rights to be at the table. So let me go to a good couple of questions we, we still need to get to. Um, I know you've been dealing with this in particular because of your focus on cybercrime, but one of the questions that's come up is really how do you how do you work in the space of cybercrime? How do you make the how do you ensure that cybercrime does not um, infringe uh, human freedom of expression? And, and what can one do to ensure that? Are there any particular initiatives or particular pieces of policy making you can point to where uh, the Human rights in the cybercrime space. Thanks. Uh, well, I would like to be positive, but I have to be honest. This question is not really trivial. Um, I think for those who um, was attending, uh, who were attending the previous uh, webinar, previous uh, question and answer session, I might sound a bit repetitive, but you told um, it never hurts to repeat some of the things. Um, when we talk about cybercrime and human rights, the two big areas where human rights have to be ensured, the substantive law, what 
is. And here the big issue is the regulation of content. So is content a crime? And what kind of content is a crime? Because governments, especially oppressive regimes, are saying that many types of the content are crime. Or they make, for example, a very broad definition of what is extremist content. And then basically any critique against the government would fall under the definition of the extremist content and can be taken down. So one of the ways to I'm I'm really I am really not keen to use the word to the word uh, ensure here. I say where we can put our efforts and we can you know establish the aim for ourselves is the regulation issue where we can provide our input and say content is not a crime and and and, and anything which is related to a content blocking should not be quick and off the cuff solution. It should by you know just private justice or just you know some request without the court order. So this uh, we can ensure human rights and freedom of expression in terms of what is. This is a very, very big issue is visual frameworks. We made an example about um you Investigatory Powers Bill, which was on the fast track, and the comment period was only uh, three weeks. But if you Google or if you send a Global Partners Digital an additional email, I can see the link to the comment submission. There are many pages of comments, and many of them are from human rights organizations and from, from, from the civil society organizations about human rights and procedural frameworks. This is one of the examples. But before further, I would like to explain what's procedural framework. So, for example, if I have crime happening, I have crime, someone hacked my computer, or even cyber crime, someone knows something and I want to intercept the communication, and I want to check this person's email address. Why am I doing this? Why I'm starting that far? It's just because when we are talking about procedural frameworks, many crimes will require digitigatory frameworks, not the cyber crime. And let's not mix this. If it's about any crime, we have to ensure human rights and digital investigations are considered. Any, not only cyber crime. And since this question is still in its infancy, the legislators, law enforcement, civil society, to figure out how to preserve human rights. It's very seamless and intuitive investigatory instruments. Um, we don't have an ideal framework for this. So what can I advise to ensure human rights? What can I advise, what, what advocate for here? Just very few, very concrete, very, very, very on the spot point. First of all, we advocate that works as interception of communication, interception of traffic data, shall be done only upon the court order or upon the court authorization for the purpose of crime investigation. This will ensure proper safeguards. As this is a golden standard found in any human rights documents and any human rights court practice, including a European Court on Human Rights, that if the privacy of home and communication is violated, it could be done only with the court order. Of course, it will depend on the, you know, independency of the court, but this is an issue. This is the issue of political system. This is the issue of the oral capacity building. But if you're talking about legal and regulatory frameworks, we, we have to ensure that a digital investigation, except maybe a request for subscriber data, which is many countries on practice is done not only for crimes and it is done only on, uh, upon law enforcement request because this is a very uh, this is a less intrusive measure but even then we can find that the new process and proper frameworks to access any subscriber data so we should be um we should be aiming for more judicial oversight a proper uh, court safeguards due process uh, to appeal against this measure, 
make many measures open and self clandestine, for example, search, computer search, or computer, or computer seizure, open human rights standards. So, yes, basically, for law, cyber crime, advocating for what crime is and exclusion of the content crimes, refer to freedom of expression. And in terms of procedural law, advocating for due process and court authorization for investigatory in investigatory measures. Thanks. Um, one of our discussants, uh, Marilia Masia, is um, unfortunately having difficulty connecting into the um, the webinar. So we're going to try and see if we can uh, channel her responses to some of the questions and. Um, and can then uh, Aditi will jump on and uh, and uh, let us know what her responses are. And you know, one of the one of the key issues in the space is how do we are making progress as human advocates, and in what spaces are we making progress, and where's the where's the proof, where's the evidence? And um, one of the things apparent is that one of the perhaps most rewarding um, environments to get involved in when it comes to human rights is really in getting involved in the international level because it's there where we're seeing incredible, amazing, I would say, recognition of the importance of stakeholders being involved in cybersecurity discussions. So one of the things that's been happening now for um, five or six years is the London process. And this is an annual meeting, uh, mostly annual meeting, when governments come to talk about um, advances and changes in policy with regards to cybersecurity and matters. The reason this is important is because um, two years ago in the Seoul meeting um, as part of the London process, there was a growing recognition of the importance of civil society engagement. And from that, that uh, to be even greater recognition of that at the head meeting of the London process the conference on cybersecurity. It's, I think it's fair to say that at that conference, civil society did have um, active role in getting messages into the final document, the chair's document from that particular event, and, uh, and across and throughout the event, engaging with obviously other stakeholders. So this is occurring. It's and it's something uh, some, something that can be leveraged at a national level. The same recognition of the importance of, of engaging with stakeholders um, is to still recognised in various um, resolutions. It's the group of government experts in the UN in their latest report. So and those that can be referred to that have been agreed accepted at the international level, which can be leveraged at the national level. And that's another good way of, of bringing it to bear uh, at regional and national levels to say, look, this, this particular approach was agreed at the international level. Uh, we need to see that implemented uh, for the betterment of, civil, of cyber security processes and policy making as a whole at the regional and national level. So that's one way to go. And um, if people are interested in some of those references, they should, they should um, um, let us know and we can come back with some documents that can be pointed to where there's increasing um, recognition of the role of civil society and human rights defenders is, it can be. Um, Medina, maybe you want to add a little bit more to that. I also realized that um, I covered the last part of the previous question, which actually relates to this question about forks and policy processes in cybercrime. So I, I'm sorry for this. Was cited to cover human rights and, and different safeguards, but what Matthew is talking about actually relates. Uh, so there are different initiatives which are based, for example, on Budapest Convention. Uh, Council of Europe is doing a lot of capacity building in this field. There are different discussions. There was also a discussion paper on human rights and safeguards concerning Budapest Convention issues by the Council of Europe. There are some standards which and court practice of the European Court of Human Rights. Of course, it might be not relevant on other regional levels, but at least it's a good which can be 
be uh, which each one can have a look at and see how these issues were advoc advocated for. Uh, coming back to the to to to, to main issue about um, things not only not not only about cybersecurity processes because I do believe that um, still coming back to my previous point that you can also engage at a broader level like VCs like like GF. apparently if you're interested in cyber security issues or, or, or um, crime issues or so privacy issues or human rights issues you will also find uh, the room for yourself there which will eventually bring you to other forums and to other processes but I think that Matthew you, you covered it quite well and I don't have that much to add at this point thanks thanks Tatiana I think Maria has joined us. Maria, are you with us? Thank you, and sorry for the connectivity issues here. So, wonderful. Maybe um, I can put the last question to you as well as somebody who's been in these spaces for some time, articulating, advocating for human rights. Um, where do you think we're, we're seeing progress, and what are the key messages that human rights? need to be articulating to be more involved in policy making processes I think it has been immense if we think about uh, the net governance forum for instance in the first editions of the IGF if the program human rights were only a small part of the agenda if we look at the recent IF editions we see that human rights are covered by the sessions even though not specifically focused on human rights, they have the right approach. So I think it has gradually understood that no matter what issues we discuss, if they are very technical, um, um, look to it as a human rights angle. And this is very important. So I think that the, the convincement uh, of others is there. Um, I think that maybe what we need to articulate is that um, some key areas are still difficult in terms of, of making the message across that human rights issues need to be taken in account at the same time. So if you see at cybersecurity, for instance, that I'm sure that Tatiana mentioned before, uh, cybersecurity issues are an area in which there's a very uh, strong um, hold and control from 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 state actors. So uh, the the message that we need to to make sure that, that we uh, is that there's no way to think about security without uh, thinking about human rights. But I think a lot of progress has been made, and uh, maybe next year's uh, will be very challenging for human rights advocates because we are on the verge of seeing a, an evolution of the internet as we know it in terms of uh, uh, having an internet of things and all the objects around us connected, and it will certainly take under the discussion the next level, not only because it will become very technical, um, maybe harder to follow, but also because the entry points in which we need to discuss human rights will multiply. So that will take a lot of mobilization from, from human rights advocates. Yeah. Um, a question, I'm, I'm going to combine two questions coming because I think this is a, a really important and at the same time a difficult issue. And the question is, how um, how can human rights defenders make a change in policy making and the voice that they should have when the the more the governmental environment that they're working in um, is not supportive of human rights or can, for example, be an authoritarian regime? What 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 are there for human rights advocates in the types of environments to make their case and and is, for example, finding solidarity with other human rights organizations around the globe uh, addressing that. Tati, would you like to take that? Thank you very much, Matthew. Yes, I would like to talk about that because I'm always talking about different reality checks in an ideal world. Uh, I myself am someone who comes from let's say, a country with an authoritarian regime. I know how hard this is. I know that sometimes when I'm listening to people talking about diff different ways of engagement 
this thing, but this will not work in my country. How can I apply this? And sometimes I think there is no way to apply uh, what we suggest, all this advocacy and efforts in the country where even being a blogger constitutes a threat to your own, own life. What do you Yes. First of all, yes, internal solidarity. If you are engaged on, get engaged on your level, try to engage with international organizations, with regional organizations, with different human rights defenders on the international level. But I, it, might, it might be much easier if you are among like-minded minded people and if your ideas and your efforts are backed up by a very big international organization. And I think that, that maybe it doesn't sound very exciting, but yes, visibility is one of the keys. And uh, collaborating with these organizations might provide you enough visibility and also give you credibility maybe to talk to you, to approach your government on different international forums. Because interestingly, I saw many cases when human rights defenders or the policy um, uh, people from civil society who were not never listened to on a national level um, got approached by government Governmental representatives and business representatives. Once they dip into, um, uh, once they go into the international fora and they start making connections, networking, um, dialogues there. So eventually, if no one is talking to you in your on your in your country and on the national level, if you go to the international level, IGF, ICANN, different international fora. Maybe in two years, your government will be talking to you, or at least will be recognizing you and they will be recognizing that, that your voice um, might be heard. Of course, of very undemocratic regimes, I any kind of, how to say, ethical capacity to really advise uh, anything on this because I myself have never been in this real threatening situation in my country where even being human rights advocate constitutes a threat to my so I don't think that I'm really able to lecture on this or provide any advice. Thanks. Thank you. Um, work environments and different regimes. Um, can you have a sense, perhaps, as to what might be a, a good way forward when you're doing that kind of, uh, when you're trying to advocate in those kinds of environments? Thanks. Thank you. I think that the first thing um, is to get the information of what is happening on the ground across. And this is always easy because if you have a censored uh, internet, for instance, or if you want the surveillance, that may be very hard. Um, so the first thing that uh, I think advocates to have uh, in their hands is a tool set of tools that you can refer to um, in order to advance your advocacy. So you should be very well informed on the way to protect your privacy, on the, the tools that you can use to disguise your or that you know and that have been scrutinized, not have back. So these basic things are very important to protect your own life. Um, second level, I think that oh, your question is, is very important. How do we make connections with others in the region um, that may have the same problems and that may help to frame issues on the same way? And many countries, as we know, they have a very dynamic nation, uh, uh, geopolitics, regional uh, geopolitics match. So if you have a green country that starts to put pressure as well on their peers is very important, either coming from civil society organization on these neighboring countries or from friendly governments. And civil society as well operates in these internal scenarios by identifying who the friendly governments are. The government can resort to either your own government if you are uh, lucky to have a good relationship with them or the government of other country and approach them for them to make um, uh, outside, inside pressure. And of course, as well, uh, international organizations are important, international settings. So one of the examples uh, is the Freedom Online Coalition that has been created by a group of countries um, in order to leverage the standards of freedom of expression, privacy uh, elsewhere in the world. Um, so by this peer pressure, we try to navigate and ensure that the conditions even for advocacy uh, internally in these countries that are under censorship improve a little. 
but I think that there are no no country that is uh, completely uh, without surveillance and censorship nowadays. We know, for instance, uh, in Brazil, which is uh, has a very um, free internet, I would say, and uh, in many areas. But at Olympics, uh, a lot of uh, um, um, initiatives have been started to monitor communications, to prevent terrorist attacks. So I would not say that this is a matter that only uh, uh, is of interest to countries that are under surveillance or censorship because democracy is something that we need to build on the everyday. And we need to make sure that we have the tools to question our governments, even if they are uh, overall uh, seen as democratic. The dynamics uh, sometimes change, especially in this particular moment such as big events and governments tend to put in place stricter regulation and we need to be aware of that. <laughs> nice to see you, Rilia. Um, okay, we're almost to that point in time where we have to transition from the regulatory frameworks to, to the cyber capacity building, but um, to ask um, a question, um, which is a great question. It kind of, it's, not as difficult as perhaps the last question, but but it's a more general question, which is when um, when you look at the, the landscape of issues that are trying to address from a policy making perspective now, how do we ensure that we keep human rights at the top of the agenda? What what tools do we have? What pressure points do we have? And how do we ensure that the government's paying attention to to human rights? And I'm Privilege and of answering that first before I put the question to, to Tatiana and then Marilia. But one of the things that's becomes very has become very evident, and we've seen this um, as a part of the the WISTIS process, the World Summit on the Information Society, is the the kind of renewed focus, I'll say, on the Sustainable Development Goals. And what Sustainable Development Goals, and you look at the 17 of them and, and the various topics that they include. Of them are dependent upon one and um, should include explicit reference to, but they don't always, but are certainly dependent upon the realization of human rights and the intent of individuals to human rights. I bring that up is because it's, it's something to bear in mind when we keep human rights at the forefront. Is that it's not necessarily always human rights for the sake of human rights. We, we need to think about the issues and the policy spaces where the realization of rights and empowerment comes with it, can actually incredibly help people from an economic perspective or a social perspective. Um, I think when we're talking about human rights, we need to put human rights in those other dimensions as well to maintain that level of interest and level of awareness and level of realization about the importance of human rights. So that's my quick take, but Tatiana, maybe over to you and, and then to Maria. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, Tiana, we seem to have lost her for a minute, but maybe no, now so I, I muted myself. Uh, okay. I, I didn't, <laughs> but but let, let's go to Marilia. Okay. <laughs> I mean, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, if, you could, if you can just say, how do we just a couple of a minute or two on how do we keep human rights at the top of the agenda? Preferably for cybersecurity issues, but but broadly, thanks. Well, I think for cybersecurity, it's re the agenda for cybersecurity is being built right now. So that's a challenge uh, for human rights defendants in terms of having the knowledge very quickly, acquiring the knowledge and knowing the fora, which are actually the fora that we are used to um, participating and, and 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 engaging with. So for instance, there's a bunch of EU organizations that are dealing with, with uh, security issues that do not usually appear on the scene when civil society maps uh, the place, the, the fora that are interested to, to intervene. So the challenge, I would say, is to identify uh, which are the spaces, um, which is not uh, very easy. Um, one thing is that I want to define the agenda of the next uh, GGE. 
um, is a, a part of the UN First Committee that deals with security issues. And uh, this meeting, the agenda, this meeting was closed. It was a meeting to define the agenda for the next CGE, but it was closed to participation of governmental actors and just a few companies uh, and, and, and a few academics that they have identified. So there was no civil society representation. So there's a real challenge to identify the fora, um, to find the right entry uh, point. And I think that to, to prove state that have taken ownership of the topic, that the, the participation of other actors is very important. So in this particular meeting that I'm mentioning, um, governments were really astonished to see some information that was given them by the technical committee that, that they have no idea of because they did not know how the internet worked. Um, so there is a ve very developed discussion on, for instance, um, international law and cyber conflicts. Um, there are excellent uh, academics and people come from the military sector that have advanced a lot on understanding um, how the rules apply to cyberspace. However, because of the academic background, let's speak like this, they come from a mindset that is very um, state-centered um, and government-centric. So there's not cyberspace, for instance, it, is that states have complete sovereignty of anything that is located on their territory. And of course, that is very um, tricky internet infrastructure and how uh, meddling or, or tempering with critical internet infrastructure may have transborder effects. Um, so this is something that is being discussed right now, but since the agenda is being made, on the on one hand, we have a challenge to identify these spaces for very quickly and to try to find a way in. On the other hand, since the agenda is being uh, uh, defined, it's a very uh, interesting moment to make sure that it is defined in a way that is inclusive of human rights. Um, um, so I think that uh, specifically in cybersecurity, a way to keep uh, the, the theme high in the agenda is to find the spaces and particularly to, to make connections with the friendly governments that we have spoken about before. The Dutch government has a very interesting proposal on keeping the core of the internet neutral. Um, for instance, any 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 conflicts, any attacks could um, should uh, uh, have as targets the core infrastructure of the internet, such as the backbones or the the domain name system, and so on. So I put forward idea, which I find very interesting. But of course, they need international, but I would identify among um, show uh, partners that we could approach and work with because it from the idea of the internet as a public good or as a public service, service which is something that civil society has um, uh, advocated for for a long time. I think that this could be an opportunity to try to, um, to at least for the next GGE, have something more positive um, on the agenda. It is worth noting that the, the, the tone and the feel and some of the things that the GGE have put forward in their reports over there have, have, have that. and there is a greater recognition, as I was saying earlier, of the age of stakeholders. So that, that is is in a in a small way. Um, Tatiana, over to you, please. Um, I think that um, I, I will skip this question because really after you and Marilia's intervention, or oh, uh, over to me to start the next session. <laughs> thank you. Oh, over to thank you. you. I, over to you to start the next session. Because, Wonderful. Thank you. Yes, thank you much for moderating this one. Uh, we are moving to the next hour to the capacity building session uh, where I will have three wonderful discussants. I hope Matthew is staying with us um, uh, as a discussant can take part in this Q&A session. Uh, and we also have Marilia, which we already have seen, and Vladimir Vlada Radunovich from the Diplo Foundation, who is very famous in all his capacity building efforts in cybersecurity, international peace and security, cyber and, and the, uh, policy and, and, and digital frameworks and all things digital. Um, to make transition, uh, to next session, I don't know. Would you like to say a couple of words um, on the last question, which was here about rights and competing interests, and what do you think about capacity building? Maybe just one minute of, of, of a short introduction from you, and then I will move to the questions. 
for, for inviting me. It's a pleasure always being in such a good group. Um, one quick reflection, I've, I've followed a little bit of the end of the previous session, but the main question was how, how do we actually put something right in that? And I, I heard a number of times, and that's absolutely legitimate, uh, word pressure. So we press the government, so we need to pressure them to, to put it. That's certainly and unfortunately one of the most to deal with the government, especially those that are maybe not, not so uh, But also the way to help them and we operate with the government. It's, sometimes it seems impossible. I mean, we as the activists or the NGOs, but it's not, uh, especially on the on the local level. Uh, about cybersecurity and the governments which need to do to deal with cybersecurity, uh, the risks or because they want to follow the I don't know the. the European uh, standards or whatever. Uh, very soon they realize that security is not as other fields of security where they can do everything on their own. Simply because 90% of the infrastructure is in hands of the knowledge and the context is in academia, is in technical communities, in NGOs. So sooner or later the governments figure out that they can't do anything. Actually, they can't do anything. And that's the space for, for involvement of of uh, education, technical community, and so on, and we belong here and there, to help with cybersecurity measures. Uh, as an example, the CERTs, so the, the, the emergency uh, response centers, uh, which are more or less the technical or academia even uh, featuring there, and with a, with a strong emphasis on NGOs. So what I want to say is that let's look just at the ways how we pressure the government, let's see how we can help them in a in the superandi on the national level, and there try to push for human rights agenda as well. When we are and switching to capacity building, and whenever we try to build capacities, we should try to to mix the groups, try to make uh, uh, defenders in a way very aware of all the security issues simply because we want to help the government as well, and we make the government aware of the human rights aspect. Of uh, so that's kind of a kind of a um, both the beginning to stay cool as well in the capacity initiatives. But let's go on to that uh, through through the next set of questions and discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Vlada. Thank you very much for this smooth transition to capacity building. And before I will start with the first question on this, I would like to remind you that you probably saw the two videos on capacity building. And one of them was about capacity building between states. It is a very pressing and important topic for cybersecurity. I believe that this session would be rather framed in a different way. Because we'll be talking about capacity building from a broader perspective and from the perspective of your involvement. So if you watch these videos, I believe that some of the interstate debate and issues could have helped to understand how close and how inclusive and how important this issue might be for the government. So without any further delays, I'm moving to the next question. That capacity building initiatives are trying to address. Say fragmented efforts to tackle cybersecurity, or maybe the lack of shared norms, or the cross-border nature of the of, of threats or of internet and networks, uh, the overlapping and again cross-border policy questions. Um, where do human rights defenders sit in all in all this? This is a general question, and maybe we can chunk it into pieces, and maybe we can pass it again to Vlada first. So what do you think are the main challenges that capacity building initiatives are trying to address? Just a few. A couple of main challenges that, that really sticks to, uh, gets to my mind is this fragmentation. Uh, and that's kind of a we're dealing with cyber with cyber policy. In those are the national silos, the stakeholder uh, silos, the thematic silos. So you have dealing with cyber security, but they're not absolutely dealing with human rights and privacy. 
we have uh, discussions within the technical community, but we don't have discussions among technical community and government. So those kind of things are really a bench because they don't understand each other. You can really see the diplomats uh, or the two engineers from China and, and Germany understand each other much better than an engineer and a diplomat from Germany or an engineer and diplomat from China because of totally different languages. It goes with the acronyms that, that the engineering community use or the human rights community use or the privacy community use, if you wish, for human rights, compared to the cybersecurity community, it's totally different. It's a different language. So those are the big gaps. Bridging somehow these these type of issues is, is a, I mean, one of the key things. Uh, to do that, well, I guess that's let's leave it for the next uh, for the next uh, something for about 15 minutes. What would you? Uh, thank you very much, Marilia. What do you think about what Vlada just said? And what do you think? I, a very very famous human defender. In addition to the question, what challenges for you, uh, I would like to ask you also to provide some information, how do you personally fit there from your personal experience as a human rights defender? I think that Vlad uh, said in the beginning, which is um, to work with, I think sometimes we take this um, a a position which is a position that uh, human rights advocates usually find themselves in, um, in a situation trying to, to push against actors that are on the other side of the table. But the work of working together when we speak about capacity building is a very important one because no one will want to listen to you um, if they believe that you are standing on the other side or that you cannot work together, that you are not being cooperative. So uh, the capacity, I think, to translate our discourse as activists into a different um, uh, or different narratives, use tailoring uh, the message that we want to convey um, to that audiences. This is very important. And in Brazil, we had an experience with that when we worked with, with the democracy view, the civil rights framework for the internet, because this is the most important view that deals with right and responsibilities of internet users in Brazil, but that we needed to to explain the importance of it at the same time to policymakers and congressmen who were very uh, concrete and short policy briefs that tell them what the policy issues were in a way that they could not um, be lost on the technological uh, aspects of it but go to tribune and to speak. Uh, we needed to convey this message to judges because they were the ones that were going to interpret the law. Is another way of speaking to them. We needed to talk to the Googles and to the Facebooks to convince them that uh, the law would not hamper their business, but to give them to have a more concrete and, and um, uh, secure framework in which to conduct their businesses. So each actor uh, requires a different approach. I think that's one of the first challenges uh, to, to transform, transform the message and to address the different actors and to have the material to do that. Because sometimes we have an material that is targeted to a specific audience, but we don't have the resources to adjust that into something else. So it's a matter of resources too. And, and, um, and what worked very well is this quality between civil society and academics. We were working apart, we were working together at the same time. So it was well understood for civil society organizations that um, we were working uh, with academics. Sometimes academics would not sign a petition at that moment, but they would present a report afterwards that was more, more it's not addressed to do activism, but it was addressed to convince the judges and the policymakers and so on. We share that. It's not a situation that is meant to do everything. That's why uh, it's important to work together in a network fashion. Um, another thing that I think is very important and, and another set, uh, another uh, a challenge uh, different from the forum is to send the internet that we're going to operate in five years from now because the the pieces are moving so fast that sometimes when we want to understand the challenges that we have with the internet as if it was the internet of 10 years ago which will be very uh, different uh, five years from now with smart cities with the internet of things to understand exactly the challenges that we have 
um, for the, without losing sight of the battles of today, I think it's of the challenges that we have. Because, of course, we need to fight the war to support you that is in Congress next week. So it's very urgent. However, at the same time, uh, we need to give the right direction of how the Internet is going to develop in the future. And that requires resources and imagination. So how to balance that today and tomorrow in a scenario of moving it as the Internet is, this is something that, to me, is a, is a real challenge. Very much, Amelia. This is this is indeed a very exciting, practical example, and and a very interesting one. And this is why I would like to uh, same practical question, um, Vlada and and my, uh, and, and and Matthew. Um, Vlada, translate a course on the national level or on the international level. Can you share any of the examples? How do you think you feed or did? or might see it and also think about the future maybe you can um, build upon what my just said so uh, i will first give the floor to vlada and then to make you vlada the floor is yours this is in some good uh, case study is that the question yes um uh, how do you see it because we covered a lot about how human rights defenders could theoretically fit into the um, um policy making regulatory frameworks but what does it actually mean what does it, how do you build capacity how do you feed um if, if you want to come up with any practical example you can just be you can just answer the second half of my question and uh, tell me how do you think we can fit in the future and how we can actually shape this future no, thank you. Um, well, uh, from the uh, perspective of like last 15, 20 capacity building and digital policy field, uh, uh, is that uh, actually what I mentioned uh, and what Maria also commented on is, is bringing different stakeholders together. a bit of confusion. An example of, of a recent event that we did, uh, the uh, Organization for European Security and Cooperation, OSC, is working on the confidence building measures for security. And there is a set of confidence building measures brought in the couple of last years. I don't know if you already mentioned that in previous models. Anyhow, uh, last year, uh, Serbia, where, where I'm from, uh, where I'm based, uh, was co-chairing OSC with uh, Switzerland. Tasks was to organize an event on cybersecurity discussion about norms and so on. So what we did with the OSC was we did an event, which was a two days event. We opened a three hour session, which was kind of a simulation game on what happens if the conflict between two states uh, emerged. So we brought the groups, but each of the groups was actually diverse in sense of stakeholders. So we had diplomats. Uh, business sector, uh, security services, and so on. The specific case, what was happening between two and what they should the kind of a, a group to resolve the what they should do. You can't imagine the level of the shock when the real groups would actually do it. So the diplomats are calling upon the international law, what article of which convention we could possibly call on in order to resolve this. And then the engineers really were, were shocked. They were like, no, you, you don't do that. You first stop the, the, the attack. You, you try to find what's happening. And the, the security services, no, we have to find a way. Who did it? How did they do it? They were completely astonished with the entire perspective. That the and that's a perfect example, because at the end of the game, in the end, at the end of the exercise, they confused. But I have learned that there is a different view. There's a think out of their box view of resolving just about security. And believe me, within these discussions, they did touch upon uh, human rights. Because at some points you get into, okay, we, we need to go into the database of or the logs. Okay, but can we really do that? Because we interfere with the logs of the, uh, the uh, providers and so on. So there's a bit of privacy uh, and so on and so forth. So um, simply together is, is, is definitely the, the good way. The other thing I mention is um, training. It's not about a simple training. You never, capacity building, you had it in the video also. Very easy. 
said, um, capacity building is a buzzword. Uh, I think that, that we as, as a human race, if we wish, uh, should use. That's, that's a clear buzzword in diplomatic and political circles. Really actually go one, one step beyond and actually do something. That's the and usually what the, most of the institutions are happy with is we organize a training, a couple of photos, we have 250 smiling faces, we did a capacity building, that's not it. It's a process, it's a whole set of trainings, uh, discussions, research, um, back and forth analysis, it's a bit of a, a bit of a arming people through the process. Then it's, it's, a, it's an issue of policy immersion, bringing people to the process. Once they've gone through the basics, once they had a chance to discuss uh, issues and see different perspectives, and you push them in the process, they start meeting people, then they get different perspectives, then they get to be cooperate and discuss with diplomats with the years, then they get even their angles. And we're going to move further in the, uh, in the next questions on, on uh, examples of the processes. But the combination of a training exercise coaching, discussion, uh, research, if you wish, policy immersion, that's the page, that, that's the process, capacity process. Well, it was very interesting because as far as I understand, it also answers the first part of the question again. Uh, I believe that it's not about substantive issues and challenges in the policy and law making itself. It's also about the process of capacity building itself and continuity of this process and an actual dialogue. And now I will hand over to Matt. So with all the buzzwords, capacity building, how do you translate your discourse, Matthew? Where do you fit? Do you see problems and processes? Thanks, Tatiana. Um, Learnings that came out of the World of the Information Society review process um, for me was that there's no substitute for and constructive engagement, and that is a form of capacity building. It's being put into a process, um, watching how the players engage in that process and learning from that. Very, there's, there's no substitute for getting involved and doing it. And I think that is a form of capacity building that each of us as advocates have to undertake. And in some cases, people will sponsor you to do that. In other cases, they won't. But it gives you a very real life sense, particularly in international spaces, as to how stakeholders engage, what their policy priorities are around the table. And in the case of the witnesses that end up with a resolution in December 2015, that was a culmination of two and a half years of extensive work across stakeholders. And if you've been through that, you have a very good feel for the way it work. You have a good feel for the expertise that you still need as an advocate. You have a very good feel as to how others operate when around the table. And that's a very important form of capacity building. The other thing I would say is that what common perception that um, don't bring expertise to cybersecurity because cybersecurity is a typically a defense issue. It's a national issue. It's a technical issue. Um, and I have to think very hard about um, where we're bringing expertise there. And we have to make a case for ourselves in that context. It goes back in many ways to, to um, first of all, I think that we actually, we need to know the issues. Um, and it's really about developing that expertise not only human rights, but also in terms of understanding the nature of the threat, the nature of the attacks, the possibilities and consequences of responses for human rights advocates. So really getting some of the technical aspects of the and whether it be cybersecurity or some other space. Thanks. Uh, for, for the good examples and for sharing your, um, your expertise, now, the, the next question from our participants is, is how does one address an imbalance between openness and willingness of safety and the government's stage in cyber policy and cyber capacity building? So, 
imagine that you are in this forest where they just just don't want to have you. Your mouth are not opening. How can be addressed on international on national level? I know that Marilia, Marilia already shared a very good example of, of collaborative approach. But what if it doesn't work with the government? Do you think? Um, I will first give a floor to uh, Marilia. If you don't mind, Marilia, please. please. Thank you. Actually, uh, besides the example of Marcus Shugiva's national law and how different stakeholders came together to approve it, I think that another very important thing is to encourage the creation of national multi-stakeholder structures um, that deal with the internet uh, regulation and its governance, like the one that we have in Brazil, for instance, the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. So the national level is an important building block when we think about the governance level, uh, we need to make sure that the, the regional structures are in place, the national structures in, are in place, and from national to global, uh, we tend um, to, to, to be able to overcome the challenges and build a more coherent uh, scheme of governance. So, for instance, uh, when, when it comes to capacity building, uh, the fact that we have a national structure encourages different actors to be able to frame Never a training or, or a capacity development um, uh, uh, initiative is put in place because sometimes uh, we, we provide a capacity building from a standpoint, which is very interesting for the people that are around us. Uh, but in order to bring others to the discussion, to make sure that you have not only civil society but the necessary technical expertise and the people that we are bringing the, the, the business views, uh, it is important to have an agenda that is uh, openly discussed and open framed, it is important uh, to have the, the actors that will mobilize their networks and make sure that the right participants will come. And so I would say that uh, when you have uh, a national, if uh, a formal one is nice, such as the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, but, committee, but it's not, if it's not for of actors that think about capacity building together, I think that's a very important uh, thing to achieve in order to make sure that we have a very diverse group of people uh, which is necessary um, to, to take uh, the knowledge uh, first at the end of the day. If we really to have something that is meaningful for everyone and that you do not only repeat and that you already know, but you are really challenged from what you know, which is very important as well when we think about um, beauty knowledge. Uh, I think that uh, thinking about it from, from a multi-stakeholder perspective uh, is, uh, is very important. listening to you more now that they are opening more to civil society in your country to let's say academia or the synergy of both both or they are the same or in some parts more close less willing so did you did you over your challenges on this way or was it more or less the same all the time thanks For Marilia, actually, ah, for Marilia, but okay. I, yes, yes, because, yes, uh, but, Hi, Tatiana, I yes, thank you, yes, sorry, yes, I, I will repeat, uh, Marilia, if you look back, did you have many obstacles on this way to create a dialogue with the government, or they were always willing, or the, the dialogue itself, did it change? No, it changed, kind of, even, even we when we think about the friendly governments, usually even include uh, civil society and their delegations if they go to intergovernmental meetings such as the ITU, for instance. But this is a process that is built over time because it's a process of building trust. What helps on the case of the internet is that unlike other international regimes such as peace and security or environment, we started by states, the development of the internet was started state actors and this makes um, um, a fact that these actors are already involved in internet governance and produce governance for the internet. Um, if you think about uh, private companies for instance they are de facto regulators of the internet um, with 
terms of service that we agree with every day. So there is no way that the government can ignore the presence of these other actors if it wants to be effective. But this is on our side. At least they need to open avenues for dialogue. However, dialogue it, it does not necessarily entail trust. We need to build trust on the epi every day. And, and how you build trust, I think that first of all, creating this uh, framework for, for dialogue and cooperation, like uh, meetings that take place from time to time, creating national structures for internet governance, uh, knowing that you want to work with other actors as well, not only make your point, but also be able to compromise and to listen and to negotiate when need be. Uh, main proposals on the table, not only saying we don't want this or we don't want that, but we don't want this and we propose this instead because this is a better way. So taking a constructive um, position with topics as well. But it's a process. It's a process with some governments it's going to be easier because they have a tradition of interaction with non-governmental actors. With others it will be a real challenge, but it's something that is built on the everyday, I think. Uh, Vlada, now it's 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 still, and my question is: your pro were your processes easy? Was your history of engagement easy? Have you ever overcame any unwillingness or um, lack in the governments you are working with? And what would you advise in this regard? Because we are an NGO, we are educational or academic. And uh, you know, in the show, because we provide capacity building. So we have a little bit easier, and then we focus on diplomacy, obviously. So we have kind of an entry point to both diplomats and uh, non government actors, uh, diplomacy and cyber. It's a little bit easier for us. So, in my personal experience, it was not that hard, simply because it's our mission to try to link the dots. But in the experience of, of various communities that work in, including in my country and others, Problem and the Marilia raises a kind of a the sense word, which is trust, and this is something that's really hard. Uh, as in, in every in every process, uh, cyber, uh, the, the power of the, of the human rights defenders can can be based or the, the way into the discussion it can be based both on or pressure and co cooperation. Now, if I can try to think of a couple of for, for rights uh, activists, how to get into the process. Um, we, um, think about the board international and national level. On the international level, make partners with other stakeholders and with other countries. That seems there are countries that we mentioned some that are interested to help um, capacity building, to, to help the dialogue, to help human rights be more involved in national processes. Uh, the, uh, take care about that as well because you don't want to, to go over where your government might consider you a player. Um, partnerships with other states as well, with technical community and private sector. This is important on national level. I met you in one of the comments now in the chat. Raised the important issue that sometimes uh, the government see the the civil society as lacking the experience, lacking the expertise. Um, that's to do it is come or, or ch change a little bit your modus of work from simple advocacy to more of the research, more of the evidence building, more of the uh, policy research if you wish. And if you do that, you do that in cooperation with technical community and uh, business, which might have a lot of uh, data about cyber in any way, uh, together with, uh, with the academia, because they have a lot of theory in the background, make partnerships. And the other one, uh, Marilia mentioned, be constructive in all the discussions. Don't don't just go against everything. Try to be diplomatic. Have to also learn. We as, as civil citizens, we also have to learn diplomacy. That's a very important thing because that's the way the governments work. We have to be constructive, and sometimes we don't like it. It's not always practical, but we have to learn that uh, that that uh, diplomatic culture. And the last point is take the lead. And then, uh, diplo had a couple of success. It is exactly because we took a lead. Because we said, okay, the government sector, different governments in the in, in one government, different ministries, education ministry, education ministry of um, um, 
administrative whatever of security, they simply don't talk to each other. I mean, they seem like they do, they're within the same government, but actually they don't cooperate on, on issues like cyber. They just don't meet. They still don't meet with the private sector. Usually the private sector even don't meet, meet with each other on the same thing. So because we are real, because we are flexible, we and we'll see if with the black guy, we simply um good contact we we trust, as Marilia said, a lot of research, a lot of expertise, but then we manage to bring them together. The, okay. We are we are academic institution, it's easier. Uh, advocacy group it's a little bit harder. But you can find another institution which is capacity to bring them in this partnership. And this is what I've been talking about. Seems like I was talking about a process. That's true. But the public building actually is the process of dialogue. It's dialogue, it's a process of learning, and it's a process of being involved in policy making. So all these components are part of capacity building. And that's how we should, uh, we should look at it. I don't know if this was how the bullet that came to my mind. Uh, and I think that Matthew, one of our speakers already may, might feel a bit abandoned, Matthew. I know that the UK is very famous for promoting multi-stakeholder model, but I want to ask for your experience, does it really function well? Have you ever faced any unwillingness from the government? Uh, have you ever overcome any obstacles in this regard? So just share your experience before I'll move to the next question. Uh, thank you for the question, and also thanks, uh, Vlada, for those uh, for an excellent summary. That the one that resonate for me, and, that, and I'll give an example as to how as to why are uh, the initiative and building trust. So too often, and, and some of the questions have reflected this, but all too often, human rights defenders are seen by governments as being uh, difficult to work with, or antagonistic, or or, or just. Um, they're not governments are not open to 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 talking to them, and this is something that needs to be addressed in a, a you know, um, would be fundamental to trust building. So it's easy to engage in a policy process and to advocate for human rights. But what's perhaps more rewarding and perhaps more beneficial is to take one of that process to take the initiative and find an issue area where human rights are important, but it, which may not be so um, high visibility, so controversial, to find the appropriate people in government to work with them and to actually develop that trust. Uh, because that sitting at the table, articulating views without having the pressure of a policy process around you is often a good way of kind of coming to a, um, not necessarily a likeness of mind, but at least um, understanding of, of a particular issue or challenge. And at the end of the day, what's really important is that government officials understand that they can work with civil society. Uh, that's one of the points that Vlada was making. We have to look at this as find commonality of interest and purpose. It may not happen in a visibility issue space such as cybersecurity, but it could happen somewhere else and be leveraged into that are more high risk, such as cybersecurity. So that's some of the great suggestions that I was making. The the what I wanted to point out is that ways of, of what I just said, there are ways of actually coming together in areas where the coming stakeholders may be more maybe easier. Um, so, for example, in the in the United Kingdom, there's a, a group called the Multi Stakeholder Advisory Group on Internet Governance. Is exactly that. It is a multi stakeholder group convened by the UK government and advisory, and it uh, deals with issues uh, broadly under internet governance. And it entails is coming together, together every month or every two months to, to see a range of issues. And these aren't just cyber issues, they're issues from engagement at the ITU to uh, prize for the IGF and to a whole range of issues. This is done in a very collegial, internet sharing, perspective sharing way. So it's building that fundamental trust. So when more difficult issues arise, they can be discussed in a productive and constructive way. And maybe taking small steps and 
um, sitting down with policymakers and bringing in other stakeholders and saying, we have a challenge here, taking the initiative, let's talk about it in a constructive way, taking the, the kind of the pressures of policymaking, that's towards building that trust and, and being able to work um, as well, if you will, with other stakeholders. Thanks. And uh, to follow up about equals and about multi-stakeholder and collaboration and trust, I, I would like to ask the question uh, about IGF and similar fora. Uh, actually, I believe that the question about IGF was asked with regard to uh, regulatory frameworks. But uh, I personally would rather prefer it in the capacity building because, in my opinion, uh, the such forums as IGF and like regional national IGFs that exist not only uh, for binding outcomes because they do not produce any binding outcomes, but we can rather consider them from the point of view of, of changing the whole landscape of how we think about cyber policy and security, of how we are working on it. And in this regard, I would really ask to ask three of you, um, uh, what do you, as, 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 as um, those who are engaged in the IGF, in VCs, in um, different regional internet governance initiatives, what do you think about the, them, and in particular IGF and other forums? which does not produce any binding outcome. How successful are they? How, how, what is their role in build, building trust and capacity? Um, to what extent have the outcomes or concerns raised by different stakeholders of all these meetings have been incorporated in the final policy making or legislation results from your perspective and ended accordingly? So I have two, two, two questions which consist of two parts. Their role in capacity building and how they actually fit into the whole um, effort of, of uh, contributing into policy making processes. I think I will give the floor to Vlad first. Thanks. Thanks. Well, I'm that. Building is, is beyond the simple training, it's a process. And uh, participating in, in a process like IGF is an important part of, of, of the. Uh, um, uh, usually, when we do the, the program, what we usually try to do is combine training, especially online uh, online training, and then in situ training and courses, and so also the people with the basics uh, discussions, but then try to find a way for these people, for the best people, to have the even the national idea, the things and, uh, and all the other, simply um, they can meet different stakeholders, they can listen to different discussions, they can get some more courage uh, questions. And then step, usually, most people actually stay on their own in the process and continue coming to the IGFs and uh, being active. And that's where they actually have knowledge and they have, they have um, they can actually contribute to discussions. And that's where they actually start contributing to discussions. So in that sense, the IGF, the global IGF, is an opportunity to meet a complete variety of opinions, uh, professional cultures, uh, topics, and so on, and create networks, and get this confidence after going through the courses that you actually understand the topic, start talking, start contributing. Same goes for the regional IGFs. With the, the regional level, you have even more chance because to expect it because people need you. People need your opinions, uh, and then usually you would be the one to start the national IGF if, if it's not already there. Now the policy IGF and the the format that I mentioned with the, with the four discussions where there is not actually any kind of decision is usually not there. At least simply because they should be there. They have so many things, there's so many uh, they should visit and so on. They have to there events where things are happening and if they don't do it, they miss miss something happening at the at the IT event or whatever. They'll be for example, being there. If they're not 
not going to miss anything in the sense of the, the output. Uh, the thing that we have helped governments understand better, we uh, kind of clear cut on how we should bring more government in this process. But this is a way to, um, uh, to, to raise the fact we have in the government. It's not our goal to exclude them from the and let us dominate it. It's our goal to bring them in and sessions. That's for the region level and so on. And the mention was how do we actually measure the impact of that? If, if, if any one of you managed to respond to that, you'll get into the whole phase of, of internet to <laughs> because it's unmeasurable. But that's the trick that I, that I challenge you to think about. How do we actually make this more interesting? How do we actually measure the effect? Yeah. I would like everyone to make a note concerning the previous question. There is at least one forum where civil society dominates society and not governments. And this has been officially said on the record by other Radonovich. Um, Maria, it's over to you now. Um, I, I know that you have been participating in, in, in the IGF, I think, for, for you know, at least for many years. What do you think about this in terms of capacity building, IGF and, 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 and course alike, and also on the, uh, about their influence on the policy making and, and legislative processes, uh, taking into account that they do not produce any binding outcome? Thank you, Tatiana. I've been doing the IGF since 2007, and so it's been a long time. I think the IGF, in terms of policy making, um, is on two main aspects. The first one is agenda setting. So, go, go over the, the themes of the workshops of the IGF, the main sessions. So, what are the hot topics? What are the concerns that the different actors have today? Because they're the ones that propose the work, they are the proposal of all the sessions. Since I remember that back in 2007, uh, critical internet resources was an issue that was bubbling among different actors, but somehow there was this uh, tacit fact not to question uh, the arrangement for critical internet resources, but the IGF was the, the, the first forum to do so and to put officially in the agenda a discussion about the management of critical internet resources back in 2007, and since then, it issued a has been included not only in the IGF but also elsewhere. At the end, international domain names was discussing the IGF for the first time and it became an important topic in ICANN and ICANN actually developed policy for the end. Um, so IGF has a very important role in terms of agenda setting which uh, the first one of the first phases of, of policy making process. So I think that it does not have an impact on policy making only because it does not make any or, or concrete decisions in the end of the meeting. And a very important aspect of policy making is harmonization. So others go to the IGF and they become exposed to different ideas. They need to understand how this topic that I am confronted on my national level has been addressed by the neighboring countries or of the world, but has been addressed on the regional level. Uh, is the level the best one to address my problem or the regional level? So we need to understand, and this uh, little by little process of harmonization of approaches is very important. It's very hard to approve something um, about the internet nowadays, like a treaty or, or an international law. There are some different views on how to regulate the internet. I think that the process of harmonization and so and 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 so the role in policy making. On top of it, I think it depends a lot on the And one of the things that I would suggest to members of the IGF is to try to separate and signal uh, to the IGF participants which ones are more uh, apt to be sessions related to the which are not. Because the topics in the IGF that are being discussed for five, six years, they have advanced a lot. And maybe it's not a session for a newcomer, for instance, or someone that wants to be in contact with the topic for the first time. But there are topics that are developing now. And that this session, people do a recap 
uh, how are we, what is the state of the art, uh, what are the next steps. So these sessions, they are very prone to capacity building. The IGF, and it's been addressed to some extent, is intersessional work, work because the signals are an aspect of capacity building is what you do after the lecture, what you do after the webinar. We cannot just stop there. We need to take the actors by the hand sometimes to show the next step. Best practice for us. And I think that on the thematic topics that the, the best practice for are active, actually there is an intersessional work that serves capacity building as well because you continue to exchange ideas with others. Cybersecurity is one of the uh, in the most recent um, best practice for by the IGF is cybersecurity. So I think for capacity building, but we need to, to navigate a bit the sessions in the IGF and then value for policy making. And if I compare, um, my uh, concern is that sometimes we need to, to measure um, how much strength we want to put um, in forms that are of the future and how much strength we want to put in other forums. If you have limited resources, I, I have heard from some um, civil society organizations, I have two, three people. Should I go to the IGF or should I go to this meeting that I know that will produce? Sometimes you need to make choices, and I think that we need to understand that as well. It's many organizations to participate. If you have the resources to participate in the IF, I think it's a very valuable space. Um, but you have a lot that is going to be approved on the next day, and you need to measure what to, where to put your resources. I would say go on um, and, and, and fight on, on decision-making spaces, because this is something that will have concrete impacts tomorrow. IGF, you may have more information and view the networks to fight better your battle on the national level. So that uh, it's worth to participate. However, we need to distribute our efforts, and sometimes I feel that they are not very well distributed. We speak about the IGF a lot because we are afraid that the IGF will not exist tomorrow. The mandate has been renewed, so we need to make sure that we participate not only in the IGF but also in other spaces that are making actual decisions about internet governance too. Thank you for this issue, actually, towards the, the end of the session, a very cross-cutting perspective for both, uh, both policy-making, regulation-making, um, any visible outcomes uh, or forward-looking outcomes or capacity building. Vlad, do you have anything to add on this? I'd like to emphasize that part of capacity building is not just understanding the processes and the, the it's also Understand the different professional cultures and uh, and uh, in order to be able to negotiate, in order to, be able to impact, discuss, uh, the, to, to, to have dialogue, you have to know how the other is um, in and work. And a good example on that is the World Summit on Information Society. Geneva in 2003 could uh, sitting in a closed room, just the government. Without letting even the CEO of ICON being inside, they were huge size and how the governments are packed. And outside of the room, you had boots with activists, uh, Linux community, even Microsoft. Different because they were not in the room. Uh, NGOs were in, in shorts and t-shirts. Uh, the Microsoft guys were in jeans and with uh, with suits and stuff. Up, if you the IGS. You would see t-shirts. You would see many of the NGO activists in suits and ties. Um, there's a bit of different way of communication where we understand the procedure. Uh, first, IGS, and especially the WSIS, when you would talk to the NGOs, simply not obey the rule of um, simple discussion. So you have to raise a hand, you have to start talking. That was it. Now you really have a procedure, and that's what we learn from diplomats. That's useful. What the diplomats learned from us was content, was the they need to understand to, to, to ask someone else for the expertise in between. And I can co conclude this one with a, with a, with a tweet, so to speak, that it's not only the government that about cyber. It's all us, human rights, civil society, technical community, that need to learn about diplomacy and policy making. Because we can learn about different professional cultures, and that, that's how we dialogue. I'll stop there. Thanks. And um, we do have a question 
about law enforcement, uh, which I'm going to answer at the end of the session. Uh, because it's maybe a more focused one. But before I go there to that last question, I would like to give a floor to uh, Matthew. Maybe he wants to say something on the IGF too. I think that's been said on the IGF. I think uh, Marie gave an excellent example of how you have to prioritize your resources and the approaches you take to different spaces. But what I want to say actually is that we as a community, as the advocacy civil society, human rights community, we need to um, do more in terms of reaching out to governments and to stakeholders. We will find that our issues will be far better addressed if we work with other stakeholders. And really has said words to this effect, and, and I think about it as well. And if we find commonality of purpose, then we will be far more successful in having our views come across. And the other thing I'd just like to, to leave you with the thought that, that um, going to places like the IGF or the Freedom Online Coalition or the GCCF, which are more cyber-related, is an excellent place to build relationships. We build relationships within our own networks, but far more important when you think about it in terms of influencing policymaking, relationships with, with and influencers from other stakeholders. And that's capacity building in my mind. So think of these spaces as places to build those relationships that, that down the road will Hope you be far more effective when it comes to policy making. And uh, leave it there. Thanks, Tatiana. Thank you much. And the last question, because we don't have the, the that much time left, but I believe it, it is a very important question: is uh, how we engaged uh, as law enforcement on cyber issues from a civil society perspective. Did, uh, get maybe I, I didn't get the, this question right, but I believe that this question is about working with law enforcement. The civil society does not enforce the laws. So my answer to this would be that we always have to, to find the right, um, right um, body to tackle because the law enforcement are not responsible for the bad laws. If you law enforcement as, as human rights defenders, please bear in mind that they are not responsible for bad laws. Where you can uh, kind of synergy with them is to in proposing different solutions. For example, if they are proposing any frameworks or adopt any frameworks or call for adoption of any frameworks, you can always engage in the dialogue and ensure that uh, proposing human rights. But if you're talking about who passes the laws, you with the governments, uh, with businesses, with legislators, with the whole range of stakeholders. So it's not only about law enforcement. Because if you tackle a problem of a bad law, you have to do it in the court or by grassroots movements of advocacy. But it's better to tackle it as early as possible from, from, from the point of inception of this bad law, from the point of inception of this uh, policy that is harming human rights. And I would like to um, Marilia or Matt, if you have to add anything on this, please make yourself known. I will just call you one by one. Marilia, do you have anything to add here? On excellent point. I think that we need to, to, to have entry points. It's very important to have a good relation with law enforcement so we can have a dialogue with them. Mm -hmm. We can speak in two different worlds, but it's also important to understand that the moment, the most to, to tackle the issues, to make sure that bad laws that empower law enforcement disproportionately are not approved in the first place. So um, I think that uh, legislation is fundamental, and you engage in conversation with law enforcement uh, also to understand how, um, how, to cooperate, how they can do their job without hampering human rights and make them understand that the protection of human rights is also the protection of society that they have sworn to protect as well as a whole. So the role is not only to fight the criminals, but to protect society as a whole. And that means respect human rights. Thank you. Anything to add before I will wrap up? Actually, I mean, help, we can help law enforcement agents. Let's think about how we can help them. Yeah. Thank you very much. Matthew, I will give you uh, the last word as to a first moderator because I believe that we are 
um, at the end of the session. And I would like to thank you all warmly. Really, Vlada, thank you so much for joining us, for sharing your expertise. Thank you to you as a co-moderator. Thanks to Global Partners Digital for organizing this session. And I will use Vlada's cheek and everyone <laughs> to conclude this meeting with a tweet. Of course, only you want. And uh, Matthew, now the floor is yours for for your final remarks. Thank you. And and thanks, co-moderator, and also Vlada and Marilia. It's been a, a great session. Um, to all of you watching in and sending in the the great questions. Thank you very much for your participation and um, partners. And uh, look forward to doing this again. Thank you much. Thank you. And then the next part of the week will be the regional webinar. Uh, this will be um, the information on that will be on our Twitter and on our main page, um, which uh, Danny can give in. It's in the chat. Very good. Um, so hopefully, see you over the next couple of weeks for the. Q and A sessions. Um, if you do have any more questions, as we said, please do um, send in, tweet, and the um, hashtag CyberTalk. Um, it's been really great um, doing these sessions with you. All right, bye bye. Bye. bye.